Take out our Bibles this morning and turn to the Gospel of John. Gospel of John, chapter 1. Over the past handful of weeks, we've been tracing uh, conversations or encounters that people had with Jesus. And as I kind of, let me get this microphone in place here, uh, as I kind of tried to wrap my head around where I wanted to go with this, I wanted to, I wanted to steer away from those miraculous encounters that people had. Those are quite familiar, whether it be someone, whether it be Jesus feeding the 5,000 or Jesus healing someone who is sick or even raising the dead. And we've covered those in other messages. But what I wanted to focus on was these encounters that people had with Jesus, where Jesus is bringing them out of the darkness of sin and exposing them to the light of the gospel. And uh, so that is what I wanted to focus on. And uh, these outstanding examples of encounters that people had with Jesus. Not covering them chronologically, but uh, we are this morning, I wanted to, uh, to cover an encounter that Jesus had in calling one of the twelve by the name of Nathaniel. So before we get into the text this morning, let's bow our heads and pray. And we'll ask the Lord to bless the time that we have together in his word today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we bow before you this morning, confessing that if there will be any spiritual good that takes place in this time together, that it won't, become, it won't happen because of a well-crafted sermon or the speaking abilities of the preacher, but only by the powerful working of your Spirit within us. So we ask that you would open up the Word of God to us today and minister to our hearts. You know each person that is here in this room and you know the need that we have and we ask that you would minister to our needs according to the Spirit of God by the Word of God today. We pray, Lord, that you would give the words to say in the preaching. And, Lord, use what is said by the power of the Holy Spirit to draw sinners to Jesus and to draw Christians closer to yourself today. We pray for our children's ministry today and ask that you would work in the hearts of our young ones. And we lift up before you gospel proclaiming ministries all around this community and all around the world. That the gospel of Jesus Christ would be proclaimed by the power of your spirit today. That you would do a mighty, mighty work. And we'll give you all the praise. We'll glorify you for what you do here. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. John chapter 1, I want to begin our reading in verse 43. John chapter 1 and verse 43. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. 
Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, Hereafter you shall see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. We see in our text this morning that the Lord calls Philip to follow him. Philip immediately went and searched out this man, Nathanael. Now, interestingly, as we trace the gospel records and compare the lists of disciples that we have in the various gospel records, it seems that this man, Nathanael, also went by the name Bartholomew. It was not an uncommon thing for people to have more than one name that they were referred to by. So Nathanael or Bartholomew. And uh, so Philip says to him, we have found the Messiah. And he identifies him. He says he is Jesus, the one from Nazareth. And Nathanael says to him, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Uh, the people of Nazareth had a reputation during that time of being a coarse and a difficult group of people. And uh, so Nathaniel here is reflecting kind of the general sentiment that, uh, you know, Nazareth is just kind of the, the area where we don't get along with those people very well. So uh, Philip did not get bogged down in a debate. He simply said to Nathaniel, come and see, come and see. Let that be an example to us. And I spent some time on this last week, so I won't pound this issue again. But let that be an example to us. We're so often tempted to, as, we're to, as we talk to people, we, we, get it, we allow ourselves to get wrapped up in, uh, in, in societal debates, political debates, whatever. You know, we need to simply take people to the person of Jesus Christ. Follow that example of Philip, not getting bogged down with this whole thing of, oh yeah, we don't like those people in Nazareth, but just simply come and see. As they approach Jesus, Jesus called out to Nathanael. He says, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. And not only was Jesus claiming to know him, but it seems that he was speaking in a complimentary fashion about Nathaniel. Now, if there's any way to get someone's attention, say something to compliment them, right? You can talk and talk and talk and have very little attention from somebody or towards somebody, but say something complimentary, you will have their full attention. And so now Nathaniel is, wow, how in the world do you know me? How in the world do you know me? Um, so I assume that maybe, uh, I mean, why did Jesus say an Israelite indeed in whom is no deceit? Maybe there was something that had recently happened in Nathaniel's life that nobody else knew about that maybe Nathaniel stuck by his honesty. You, you know, we've been in those situations. You have, I've been in those situations where being honest in a situation is, uh, is, is not advantageous to us. But you do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. And maybe Nathaniel uh, was recently in that, sir, in that situation. Jesus told him, not only do I know you, I saw you when you were under the fig tree. So it was a common thing for people to, especially in the heat of the day, to search out a, a fig tree or search out some type of a tree where they could get some shade from the sun and uh, to spend some quiet time there of de private devotion before God. I think both of these statements that Jesus made to Nathaniel showed Jesus engaging with Nathaniel and knowing some private things about him, private situations and private moments in Nathaniel's life. So now Nathaniel is completely overcome 
and cries out to Jesus, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the Messiah, the King of Israel. And Jesus tells him that he would see greater things than these things as he followed him. You know, Jesus didn't say to Nathaniel, you know, that's nothing. You know, you follow me and you're going to see the dead race. You follow me, you're going to see thousands of people fed with just a few loaves and fish. He tells him, you're going to see great things hereafter. He says, you are going to see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now that term, the Son of Man, was one of the favorite uh, favorite uh, titles that Jesus gave to himself and or that Jesus used for himself, I should say. But what that's referring back to is the prophecy of Daniel, where the Bible, uh, Daniel had a vision, as uh, the scripture says, of the Most High, and it referred to this vision of the Most High of Daniel seeing the Son of Man, a prophecy of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. So Jesus here, as he referred to himself as the Son of Man, this was not just uh, referring to his humanity. It was referring to him being God in the flesh. Very, and they understood that very, very clearly. He said, you will see the heavens opened, the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now that's uh, the angels of God ascending and descending. You might say, well, I'm not sure. That does seem to ring a bell that I've read about that somewhere in the Bible, but I'm not quite sure where. He's referring back to Genesis chapter 28, a vision that Jacob had. Jacob falls asleep at Bethel. He is so tired that he puts his head upon a stone and falls asleep that night. And God gives him a vision there of a ladder between heaven and earth and the angels of God ascending and descending upon that, upon that ladder. Jesus says here, I am. I am Jacob's ladder. I am Jacob's ladder. So what does this mean? Why was this so important? This is the, the focus of Jesus' statement to Nathaniel here in calling him to follow him. What does this mean? The first thing I want to see this morning is that Jesus is Jacob's ladder. Jesus is Jacob's ladder. The ladder is set up on earth reaches up from earth to the glory of heaven. Understand something. Heaven is closed to man. Heaven is closed to man. The closing of heaven to man is the, is the result of our own sin. Isaiah chapter 59 tells us that our sins have separated us from God. And the Apostle Paul quotes Isaiah chapter 59 in Romans chapter 3. There is a barrier between heaven and earth. There is a barrier between man and God. And that barrier is there because of our sin. In, the, in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam sinned, he was cast out of the garden. That place which represented the perfect fellowship, that perfect communion with God, the place of God's provision and God's blessing. And from that day forward, Adam and Eve cast out of the Garden of Eden and the Lord sent the angels there to guard the path, to bar them from that place of fellowship with God. From that day forward, heaven is closed to man. But the picture here is that Jesus is Jacob's ladder. Jesus, his work is that he opens heaven to man. Now, if you want to, uh, if, you, if you need to get some place that is up high, you go and you get your ladder. And what do you do? You put the base of that ladder where you are and you extend that ladder up to where you want to get to. 
Jesus Christ, His coming, when Jesus was, when He came into this world, Jesus Christ became the second member of the Godhead, truly God. He took on flesh. Jesus Christ became man. The base of that ladder was placed firmly upon the earth among us in the incarnation. He told Nathaniel, he said, Nathaniel, you, you will see the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. An emphasis there not only on his deity, but on his true humanity. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5 says there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the Lord Jesus Christ. The top of that ladder is placed in heaven which, when Jesus Christ ascended bodily into heaven after his resurrection. The top and the bottom of that ladder, what are they joined by? His birth and his ascension into heaven is joined by his perfect life and his substitutionary death for you and me. In his living a perfect life, Jesus Christ merited the blessing of God. Jesus Christ, as he constantly said in his ministry, what did he say? It is necessary that I do what I am doing in order to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus Christ lived in this earth. Not only negatively did he not sin, Jesus Christ, everything that he did, he did in perfect righteousness. What does God require of us? We often like to think, well, God requires that we do not sin. That is true, but that's only half the statement. Not only does God require that we do not sin, but God requires that everything be done in perfect righteousness. There's not a person of us in this room that can say that we don't sin. We do. We sin. We not, we're not even able to closely even say that we would be able to fulfill all righteousness. That's what Jesus Christ did for us. He fulfilled all righteousness. And he did that and died a substitutionary death on the cross at Calvary so that that righteousness could be given over unto everyone who would come unto him in repentance and in faith. So when Jacob put his head on that rock that night and he had that, that vision, that dream of the ladder and the angels of heaven ascending and descending upon that ladder, do you remember what Jacob said when he awoke that morning? He didn't say, my head hurts, I've been sleeping on a rock all night. What stood out most to him when he woke up, I'm sure he did complain about his head a little bit later on, but the first thing he said was, surely this is the gate to heaven. He saw that ladder and said, this is the gate to heaven. Not that place where he was sleeping, but what he saw in the dream, that ladder is the gate to heaven. And Jesus says to Nathaniel, I am that ladder. The open heaven was a constant theme in the life of Jesus. Remember what happened in Luke chapter 2 when Jesus was born? When Jesus was born, didn't it, uh, the, the, the Bible says the heavens opened and the shepherds that night in Bethlehem, they saw the angels singing, proclaiming glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. When Jesus was baptized, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. And the, sp the Father spoke from heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. When he ascended into heaven, the heavens opened to receive him. The work of Jesus Christ, he came and lived a perfect life and died a substitutionary death upon the cross in order to open up those closed heavens. When he hung upon the cross and he died, Jesus said, it is finished. The work of redemption, the work of opening up heaven is accomplished. Once again, heaven is opened to man. 
You see, false religion is forever trying to add something to what has already been finished. False religion will tell you, well, you know, God has done His part, and now you must do your part, and if you do all that you can, God has done all that He can, and together there is this work, and together you will get to heaven. That is the, work, that is the message of false religion. The message of false religion is if you do your best, if you are a good person, if you are a religious person, if you do all this re these religious deeds and you love your neighbor and you don't kick the dog, then you will go to heaven, right? God has done His part. Now it's up to you to do the rest. If God did 99.9% .9 of the work and it was up to you or me to just kick it in the final inch, we would be hopelessly lost. God has done the work. Jesus proclaimed on the cross, not it, not, it is almost done. It is practically done. It is uh, all but done. Jesus said, it is finished. The work is accomplished. There is nothing left to be done to make you right with God. All that is for us is to accept that free gift that has been merited for you in the life and the death of Jesus Christ. Not another cent to be paid in the price of redemption. The barriers are broken down. The gates of heaven are now open for men who would come unto God in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus is Jacob's ladder. And the work of Jesus purchase, purchases for us the blessing of God. Nathaniel that day believed on the Lord Jesus. Nathaniel embraced him. Rabbi, we know that you are the King of Israel, the Son of God. He embraced him as Lord and Savior. Jesus said, hereafter, from now on, I will show you you see, understand something. You know Jesus Christ as your Savior. There has come a time in your life, I hope, when you have come to Him in repentance and in faith, you have confessed your own inability to save yourself, that you must be saved by His work and His work alone. I hope that's settled in your heart. If not, it can be today. But if you know Christ as your Savior, salvation is not the finish line. Salvation is the finish line of making you right with God positionally. But what does God do? God saves us as we are, but does God leave us as we are? No, He does not. He doesn't leave us as we are, but the Bible says he, he, that all things for the believer have passed away, and behold, all things are continuing to become new day by day. We have new life in Christ. It is a life of growth. It is a life of becoming more like Jesus every day. As a believer, the Lord desires not only that you would, that He would change you, change your behavior, but he changes our behavior from the ground level of revealing himself more and more to us every day. He desires to reveal himself to you so that you would know him better. The work of Christ uh, opens heaven not only for sinners to gain access, but the work of Christ opens heaven for every believer to receive good things from the hand of God. Psalm 84 verse 11 says, No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. The angels of God were not only ascending, they were also descending upon that ladder. The angels descending is a picture of the believer now having access to God by prayer. Hebrews chapter 10 verse, uh, verses 19 to 22 say, Therefore, brethren having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which He consecrated for us through the veil that is to say His flesh, having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and in full assurance of faith. 
The first thing, one of the first things that happens when a person comes to Christ as Savior, one of the very first things that God does in your life is He gives you a desire to pray. To pray. One of the first things that was said about Saul in Acts chapter 9. Saul, of course, was a persecutor of Christians. And so now he is converted. He meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. And you've got all these Christians kind of stepping back, scratching their heads, saying, we're not quite sure about this yet. He's been dragging Christians off to be beaten, tortured, and even executed. We're not quite sure we're ready to embrace him as a brother yet. One of the first things that said that turned the hearts of these Christians to embrace him was, look, he is praying. He's praying. That's one of the things that God does in the heart of a believer. He gives us a desire to pray. He gives us a desire to pray. The angels were ascending, but also descending. He gives us the picture of assistance from heaven. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14 says the angels are sent from God to come and serve believers. The angels are God's agents. Now, we don't see the angels. Uh, the Bible does not, the Bible talks about uh, in, uh, there, there were times when, when believers encountered angels. Generally, when they encountered angels, they were not aware that they were encountering angels so much, much later. I don't, uh, I mean, have I ever come into an encounter with an angel? I don't know. I kind of assume probably. Did I know it? No. I didn't hear any wings fluttering. I didn't see any spectacular things going on. But I know the Bible says that angels are sent to serve and come to the aid of believers. How that happens, the Bible says generally we are unaware of it. So here, the Bible says that uh, the, the heavens being opened, we now, uh, we can pray and we can receive assistance from heaven. Uh, God promises us that he will sustain us. His promise that he will never abandon us. He will enable us to endure whatever situations he places us in by his grace. The heaven is opened and the angels of God are ascending and descending by the work of Christ toward every believer. But you know, the reality is that you as a believer, though you have, though there is access to heaven, though you can pray, though the angels are sent to your aid, yet the Bible tells us that it is very possible for the believer to shut himself or herself off from the blessing of God. The believer can take the heaven which has been opened and can close himself from access to heaven and the blessings of heaven. Psalm 66 verse 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear my prayer. Does that terrify you? It ought to. It ought to. If you know Christ as your Savior, it should be something that you cherish. That you would be able to get before God and to pray and seek God's face. Seek God's heavenly assistance every day. To have that blessed communion before the throne of God every single day. We read that verse that if we regard iniquity in our hearts, God will not hear our prayer. That ought to terrify you. What does that mean to regard iniquity in my heart? It means to cherish it. It means to... It means to protect it. Has this ever happened to you? Because I can say it certainly happened to me. God speaks to my heart, convicts my heart of something that I have done, something that I've said, maybe something that I'm involved in, and God says to me, Hey, Heatherly, that isn't right. That doesn't please me. Now I've got a choice to make, don't I? I can either humble myself before God and say, Lord, I'm, my, my, sin, my sin has grieved you and my sin grieves me. I repent of it. Or the other choice is, 
I can be stubborn and defiant, and I can regard iniquity in my heart. At that moment, I have a choice. Who do I love? Do I love God more or do I love my sin more? I will go after what I love most. Every temptation to sin, is it not a question of what do you love most? What do you love most? Do you love God the most or do you love this sin the most? Every temptation is that challenge of what you love most. And you will follow what you love. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear my prayer. The Lord will not hear my prayer. How often do we have a time of prayer unheard by heaven because there is some stubborn defiance in our hearts? Maybe, maybe there's some type of a tiff going on between husband and wife. And you've each backed yourselves into your corners, refusing to even give an inch. And there is sin of pride and stubbornness going in both directions. And the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3, and it lays the onus especially on husbands. It says if you don't live with your wife, if you don't dwell with your wife in a knowledgeable way, you are cutting yourself off. God will not hear your prayer. How many prayers go unheeded from heaven because we are treasuring iniquity, we're treasuring sin in our hearts? We need to keep short accounts with God. We need to get before the Lord every day. Lord, I need to have blessed fellowship with heaven. Lord, could please touch my heart. Don't let me even for a moment in, uh, stay, with my, uh, stay involved in sin. Lord, I need to, to know about it so that I can forsake it and get away from it. We need the Lord. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1 says that when we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Every believer, that is our greatest blessing, our advocate with the Father. Praise God, Jesus Christ came as Jacob's ladder. Jesus Christ came, was placed upon this earth, and Jesus Christ did 100% of what he set out to do. Jesus Christ, Jacob's ladder, reached all the way into heaven Mankind has tried over and over again to find a way to reach heaven by our own abilities and merits. And every effort that we have, have, uh, have enacted has come far short. There is only one ladder. God Almighty placed the full weight of His dependence upon that ladder. Jesus Christ bore the weight and God was satisfied with everything that Jesus did so that Jesus was able to say, not one person who ever comes to me will I cast out. If you were to peer into the pits of hell this very day, you would find people of every race, You would find people of every language. You would find men and women. You would find religious people. You would find non-religious people. But you know what you would not find in hell? You would not find even one person who called out in repentance and in faith to Jesus Christ to be saved. That ladder has never failed. You know, here's the thing. If you've got a ladder... The ladder has got to be dependable. If you've got a ladder that uh, the rungs are getting rickety, what do you do? Do you keep that ladder and say, you know what? I think I can be 60% sure of that ladder. No! You don't get on a ladder that you are not 100% certain of, right? I sure hope you don't. When I was in my 20s, kind of a knucklehead in my 20s, I, sorry for you 20-year-olds. I'm sure you're much better than me. But I had, a, I had one of those ladders that had different knuckles on it. And you could configure it into different, uh, different uh, configurations. So I needed to cut an attic entrance into my ceiling. Identified the spot as my first home. Didn't have an attic entrance. I got a lot of stuff. It needs to go up there. I got to have a ladder. So I need to cut an attic entrance. So I get that ladder and I form it into a, a little scaffolding base. 
But you know, I'd had that ladder for a little while and I didn't really think to read the instructions that were on a sticker on the ladder that it's not really meant to just put it in that configuration and stand on it. You're supposed to put a plank on it. But you know, I don't have time for that. I got, I got work to do. So I get my saws on, I'm standing on that thing right in the middle, I'm working on it for about an hour, and what happens, about the time I'm cutting those, uh, I'm cutting the wood, the ladder knuckle uh, snaps, and I'm holding myself by my chicken wings uh, between pieces, of, and somehow I didn't slice myself open with the saws on, by God's grace. You know, it didn't take long after that. Of course, you know, eventually I figure out, yeah, I'm not supposed to use it that way. But, you know, I didn't keep that ladder because I knew from that point forward something was weak because I had abused that ladder and it can never again be trusted, right? You can't get it wrong with a ladder. Once a ladder has proven itself to not be dependable in all circumstances, you get rid of it, you get a good ladder because you don't want to be in a tall place and not be able to depend upon what you're standing on. Praise God, Jesus Christ, Jacob's ladder is 100% reliable. 100% reliable. He saves all who come unto God by faith, uh, unto God by Him, and He saves them to the uttermost. He is a ladder that will bear the weight of every sinner who comes to Him. There is nobody that's ever come to Jesus that has found out, well, you know, there was some fine print on those words of Scripture. We weren't quite uh, aware of just how deep of a sinner you would be. No, all who come to him will be saved to the innermost. He's never failed to do all that he said he would do. He has without, without fail taken every sinner who has come to him safely to heaven. He has the power to save you. He has the power to deliver you, present you as Jude tells us, faultless to the, in the presence of God's glory with exceeding joy. He is the one. He is the only ladder there is no man on this earth that can, that can take you to heaven. There is no priest, there is no pope who can represent you before God. There is one and one alone, and that is Jesus Christ. He is Jacob's ladder. But heaven is still shut to every person who seeks to come a different way. Have you put your faith solely in him? Have you, is the heaven now open to you because you have come unto God by Him? I hope that's settled in your heart. I hope you would be able to say to me this morning, Pastor Jared, I know 100% sure I'm on my way to heaven because I've tr trusted in Jesus Christ as my Savior. If I were to ask you this morning, do you know you're on your way to heaven when you die? If today were to be your day, if your response would be, I hope so, I think so, as far as I know I'm going, not quite sure. If any of those would be the response of your heart, guess what? You're, you need to get this settled. You need to get this settled. You need to know. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13 says, These things I've written to you who believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. That's what Jesus has done for us. I hope that's settled in your heart today. And if not, let today be that day. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that our Savior Jesus Christ came as Jacob's ladder. We thank you that as he revealed himself to Nathaniel here, he is the one access to God the all-dependable, trustworthy access to God, the one who opens heaven for us, the one through whom the blessings of heaven flow toward us. And so this morning we come before you and we ask that you would minister this word into our hearts today. And I ask, Lord, for those who hear this message at this point, this matter is not settled in their hearts. I pray that today 
this would be the day that they come to know Christ as Savior. I pray for every Christian that we would be today getting to know our God better, that we would be enjoying new life in Christ, that we would enjoy the access to, that we have uh, to the resources of heaven in and only through him. Help us to be growing in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We commit these things to you, Lord, in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.